Now to part one of our four-part series on strengthening your marriage. David and Tracy Sellers, the founders of Vows to Keep Marriage Ministry, on how the Ten Commandments can be applied to your marriage. Here's Jennifer with more. Well, maybe this is your situation, or maybe it's a situation of someone you know. The marriage is going okay, maybe okay, maybe not. Regardless, you want to make it better. You've read marriage books, you've watched TV shows, you've done everything, but what are the key nuggets that truly can dig into your marriage and lock it together and make it move forward the way God would desire it to be? David and Tracy Sellers from Vows to Keep Marriage Ministry join us today for part one as we look at the Ten Commandments and see how we can apply those to marriage. Go ahead and let's get started with the beginning of these commandments. Well, it's tempting to look for the latest and the greatest. What's the newest answer out there to make my marriage better? When God's laid it out for us in His Word, all kinds of truth we can fall back on, and we need to be willing to review that. When I was little, Jennifer, one of the first verses I learned was the greatest commandment from Jesus in the New Testament, from Matthew 22. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It says the entire law, and we're talking about the Ten Commandments here, and all the demands of the prophets, they're based on these two commandments. So when we hear the words, love your neighbor, we don't necessarily think of our spouse mm -hmm. first. We think of the stranger on the road. How can we love them? Because it's hard to love your spouse when they've recently offended you. It's mm -hmm. hard to love them as you would love yourself because you would rather um, maybe even be in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> or the other state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the state. Uh, yeah, a lot of times couples uh, that are looking for, you know, what, what should I do to make my marriage better? They're stuck in a very interesting paradigm where they're seeking direction but anything that they read in the Bible, they're, they're almost too stubborn to see that what the Bible has to say is actually for my betterment, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like, a, ah, I'm gonna pull back when I hear things that sound like they're biblical demands of me. Ah. And I think it's a prideful response that we have um, that, that basically says, if I do this, I'm giving up some freedom, which is very much not the case. When we look at the Ten Commandments, they are given out of love for us. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately should compel us to recognize that we are freer with these commands than we are without these commands. So we start looking for biblical, marriage, biblical advice for our marriage. I think breaking down the Ten Commandments is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. So starting with the very first one, they're found in Exodus 20. Um, you should have no other gods before me. Basically, this is a command that's being given to the children of Israel because they need it. I mean, they're in a situation where if you read the Old Testament, you see there's all kinds of ups and downs of faithfulness and unfaithfulness in them. But God is faithful the whole time. Mm. Yeah. And I think we need to hear it today, too, because we have other gods before mm. our one true mm -hmm. God. And we might not think that at first, but if we evaluate our time and our resources, how we spend our days, we can see maybe he's number three. Maybe he's a little bit knocked down on the list. It's not like I don't go to church, you know, it's not like we don't pray at the dinner table, but God's just not quite number one. Yeah, Satan, I think, is, is keen enough that he wouldn't necessarily try to, to take any normal Christian and say, you don't need God. God. You don't need God at all. But instead, if he can, if he can work God down lower on our list, he's, he's already starting to win. And it's, it's almost a, a passive, pervasive thing that can happen. I say it can happen without us realizing it. Just it, little by little, it, the good things mm -hmm. that yeah. seem fine can pull us away. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely true. And, and I think this, this command applies so well to marriage because we are going to succeed or fail together at this. Mm -hmm. There's so much influence in a marriage relationship that when one starts to go, it's like when I fall off the diet train, I take her with me, right? <laughs> <laughs> we go down <laughs> together. <laughs> right. So we, we can't have a, a relationship with God that is there just for emergencies. He's got to be our number one. So if in your marriage you realize, I've got God on speed dial. Like whenever things are really bad, I'm, I'm in prayer. But otherwise, I'm not. Mm -hmm. We have to realize that this first command is, is written to us. And I think that leads us into our second commandment, or the second commandment, which is you shall not have any idols. Don't make any idols and don't bow down before them. So that makes me think, what are some modern day idols that I might bow down to? Well, I bow down to comfort and convenience. 
I like mm. everything to be going just fine. And that kind of stuff makes its way into my life and marriage very quickly. I like instant gratification. Some people fall prey to ce celebrity adoration, consumerism, just keeping up with the Joneses. All these things can make God not that number one thing. Even a person can be someone that we put in God's spot or our job or a dream or a goal that we have in our lives. And then I let the creation rule me rather than letting the creator of all have it all. That can be very easy to do because that's our surroundings. You know, we're surrounded by those Joneses mm -hmm. or we're surrounded by that consumerism mm -hmm. and it just, it starts to feel normal. You know, so important to be in that prayer life so that our, our eyes can be fixed firmly on no other idols, only on God. And it's a daily thing. Like you said, it can slip in very quickly. We have to pray the prayer, of, you know, create in me a clean heart, oh God, mm -hmm. renew a right spirit within me today because I need to start afresh with and you. And tomorrow. Today. And the next day. Yep. <laughs> and the next Keep day. going. <laughs> Keep well, going. <laughs> I think there's a lot of times where, where it's so pervasive that we don't even realize it's happening. And, and again, that's where the, the strength of a marriage is, is found because I can ask Tracy, you know, what are some of the things that are too high on my list? What are some of the things? And if she's being honest, and I would ask anyone who's, who's you know, wanting to apply some of this uh, in their own marriage, you need to be honest with your spouse. They need to know the truth. It's tempting to either go too harsh and, and lay it all out, which some of it might just be not so much a scriptural thing as much as just an annoyance. We need to be honest, though, and, and, and say, here's, here's the things I see. Um, and then recognize that they're going to want to reciprocate that. And if you can have that kind of a conversation in your marriage, that is a very humbly good place to be. You're going to grow in big ways. And you will identify what those idols are together. And you can have accountability out of it as well.